started in 1950 and uh, I resigned in 1958. I worked uh, the Lethbridge Division at uh, probably about eight or ten stations on that division as a relief operator, relief station agent. And uh, then I uh, ended up my career with the railroad at uh, Leduc. Uh, well, my dad was a railroader. He was a, station, a section foreman in Saskatchewan, and I got interested in the trains. And in Maple Creek, where I was born and raised, I uh, frequented the, the station quite often, and I picked up the code uh, as I was there working part time. And then I, I started to learn the code uh, during that period when I was in high school. That was 1955 to 1965, and uh, <clears throat> I wasn't from a railroad background. Actually, I grew up on a farm in Manitoba, but we moved to BC when I was in my teens. And uh, I worked on a cattle ranch, uh, finished high school, and I didn't want to be a ranch hand the rest of my life. I'd always been intrigued with uh, the station whenever we went in the local station. I thought that would be a great way to make a living. So uh, I didn't know any better. I signed up for a telegraph school in Portland, Oregon, and I learned Morse code by my correspondence, actually. Spent seven weeks in, uh, in Portland and got my diploma in railroad telegraphy. And so I went to the CNR in Kamloops and talked to the chief dispatcher and had a wire test. I passed it and I was hired on the spot. But he didn't want me to go out as a telegrapher at first. He wanted me to become a, an assistant agent first to learn the territory and learn the procedures. And so that's the way I got into it. You mean job, I found it's a very responsible job because it's uh, copying and delivering train orders uh, to trains going by. And each train order um, has to be letter perfect and repeated back to the dispatcher. And uh, there have been instances where a uh, word was uh, left out or a sentence was left out and it caused several wrecks where lives were lost. So it was a very responsible job and I found out it was a very dangerous job too because uh, hooking up borders to trains going by was always stressful but especially at night um, when uh, you had to stand within feet of a roaring train and especially in the winter, it would suck the snow up the track. You couldn't see the caboose coming. Uh, you were watching for the markers on the caboose because you had to hoop that order to the conductor as well as the engineer. And uh, so I, I learned a trick early on. I, I found out how many cars were on each freight. So I would count them as they went by, and I knew pretty much when the caboose was going to be showing up. So uh, there were there were some nail biters, <laughs> especially uh, when there were wide loads, and uh, there was an instance where um, strapping had broken on some uh, uh, flat cars of lumber, and it, they would sail through the air like a wing and just take your head off. If, but they they changed they made them daylight operation only. And uh, the operators were all aware of it because you'd have to really watch out for anything that was wider than normal. There was more job, more to our 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 uh, uh, work than just the train order section. Well, we also became f uh, familiar with the station operation. That's the freight and ladling, made, making ladling uh, for the freight and also express that was 
brought, brought in uh, selling tickets uh, on the, for the passenger trains and also we were capable of even making up tickets for, for uh, uh, the ocean liners. So uh, we, had to, we had to learn all those things. Well, it depended on, on, on uh, which shift you were working. If you were working in the midnight shift, of course you slept all day. And the only time you had to, <laughs> yeah, the only time you had social life was the evening. If you worked the afternoon shift, you didn't have any social life in the evening. Uh, you slept part of the day and part of the night. <laughs> the day shift was the best shift to have, but you had to have a lot of seniority to, to, to get one of those day shift jobs. In my, in my case, um, I did a <clears throat> first trick, which was a day job, 8 to 4, at Red Pass Junction because I wanted to get married and I didn't want to get married when I had a temporary job. So I was bidding on just about everything that came up and all the other three guys in that station had more seniority than I did, so I figured there's no hope I'm going to get the day job at Red Pass Junction. I got the day job at Red Pass Junction. It was so busy, we had uh, four work trains out on the Alberta sub, and the day job was so busy that none of the other guys wanted, wanted to, to have that ship. And a day in my life was go to work at eight o'clock in the morning, sign the transfer on the orders, and sit down, and you didn't move until after four o'clock, most days in the summer, because there were so many so many orders issued during that eight hour shift. In fact, one night I went down, back down in the evening, and we had a hook under the desk and you had to keep a copy of every train order on that hook. I went down and uh, uh, sat in with the second trick operator and I counted the orders that I had copied in the eight hour shift. There was 88 train orders that I had copied and delivered during an Ship. So that was my kind of day, but they just flew by and you were right in the middle of, I worked with two dispatchers, the train dispatcher in Kamloops, the train dispatcher in Spinders, because Red Pass Junction was where the North Line branched off to go to Prince Rupert. And uh, you just, uh, working with one or the other, if you are working with Smithers, Kamloops was trying to get you. If I was working with Camelope, Smithers was trying to get me. I was a popular guy, but the day just flew by and I was right in the middle of all the action that was happening. So. Oh, I, I got honored them. There, there are a lot of things that went on during my career. Like, for instance, uh, uh, early on when I was still green, I worked at a station called Burmese in the Crow's Nest Pass. And uh, there's the the May storms. You remember those storms? It took down all the all the telegraph lines. So uh, we had trains sitting at my station, not being able to go because we didn't have orders. And uh, they, there's they tried to connect Lethbridge through Calgary, through Pentic or through uh, Revelstoke, through the Crow's Nest Pass to my station in Burma. <laughs> And uh, that was pretty far. It didn't really work too well, so the train sat there for eight hours, and it was it was an experience. I was working at Kelowna, working midnights, and in the depot there, there was a big freight shed at the end, but there was no door connecting the two, and there was a CPR mixed train left at one o'clock in the morning, supposed to leave at one in the morning. One of my jobs was going in to wheel out the big four-wheel station cart to load the baggage or express onto the onto this train. But I had to go out on the platform and go through the office to go into the freight shed to wheel the cart out. And the lights were on. This was quarter to two in the morning. So I looked through the glass window of the door and it was uh, one of the express agents, and he was working on this month end. I guess he had cash piled up in front of him, and, and I should have rapped on the door, but I didn't. I had my key, I unlocked the door, and I walked kind of in behind him. 
and all of a sudden he realized I was there and he had a service revolver, like he was an express agent, traveled on train sometime. And he had this 38 revolver and he spun around and I was about two feet from him. <laughs> Nothing was pointed right at my guts and, <laughs> and then he started to shake, he recognized me. He turned white as a sheet. I said, oh, I'm sorry, and I walked past him, <laughs> pulled the cart out, loaded it on the train, put the cart back in. I walked in, and he's sitting there. He's still white as a sheep. <laughs> he's got everything put away. And he said, oh, you don't know how close you came. <laughs> he said, do you have any coffee in your office? And I said, yeah, I have a kettle and some instant coffee. Come on over. And he had about three cups of coffee before he could drive home. But I, got, I thought about that many, many times afterwards, how close I came. And it was my own stupidity because I should have just wrapped on the, on the glass to let him know I was there. But those things happen. I brought my rule book that was assigned to me in 1955. Um, as I said, I went to Kamloops Chief Dispatcher. He wanted me to go as an assistant agent for a few months to learn the territory, but he gave me this rule book, I've still got it, and he said, I want you to learn that from cover to cover because before I accept you as a telegraph operator, you're going to have to write a long written exam on it. Mm -hmm. And obviously I passed that too, but uh, I've still got my rule book, and I've, I've got a, quite a collection of old timetables. Um, this was in 63, I quit in 65, so this was one of the last ones that I had. The, the original uh, telegraph, when it was first conceived, used the key to, uh, to send messages. And eventually, they found an easier way of sending. This is a slow way of sending. They called this sending by the fist with a key. Eventually they modernized it by to developing this contraption where they shortened the, the way you send dots and dashes. It took a little practice to work, to work with this thing. But that's, uh, that was the evolving of the, of the, of the sending and receiving. Um, all I can do is just send, send a few words with a key first and see what it was like. Let's say uh, Canadian Pacific. That's done with the, with the fists. We do it with this. Is That's the demonstration. Here they got the equipment. This is a sounder, which uh, which amplifies this this thing here is the same as this thing, but this box amplifies the sound. And and all of us had a tin can behind there to really amplify the sound. Because this this sound here <laughs> is very very quiet. You couldn't hear this when the train was passing by, but you could when this was when you were using it was that. Prince Albert tobacco tobacco can. cans, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to we make used. it authentic, yeah. And uh, well, nothing else on here that's, that's unusual, well, except the clock, which was uh, the, uh, uh, the the real deal. It had to be right on every day. We had connection with the Dominion time, time signal at 11 o'clock could come on and we would make sure that our clock was exactly to the last second. In uh, Red Pass where I worked we had a standard clock and all the uh, railroaders had to check their watch when, whenever they went by a standard clock. And my candy said we get the time signal at 10 o'clock there and if the clock was out 8 seconds you had to with a sign on, this is this clock is eight seconds fast. And if it got to be ten seconds, then we had to reset the clock. And uh, all the 
trainmen would yank out their watch and check when they were in the office. The clocks went in once a year to get checked, to get serviced. That's how they, that's how important the, the, the timing was. You can you, you can set your clock on the, on those days. You can set your clock on passenger trains. Well, the, the main thing in my case was hooping up uh, trains. Although I held the day job, we would work mutuals all the time because uh, if you just worked your five-day shift, it, would, it took you two days to get out of there and two days to get back. So what we had an agreement with the dispatcher, you know, the dis chief dispatcher, that we could work mutuals. So we worked maybe 15 days straight working other shifts so that we can have a week off at a time. And uh, then, so I did hoop up a lot of trains at night. And uh, I, I still have chills about that because you're standing there and you can't see a thing. And those freight cars are going by you like, uh, and you're, you're standing basically that close to the train. Those are things that I don't miss. How about you, Well, um, I really enjoyed my time with the railroad. The camaraderie with other railroaders was, was pretty strong, and uh, I really I did miss leaving uh, the railroad. But the, the handwriting was on the wall. That was the time when they were de desalization was coming in, and they were closing stations. So uh, my tra my craft was uh, was dying, and uh, it was wise for me to try to find something else to do. And that's what I did. I left the railroad, but I, had, I really regretted leaving the railroad. I think it was, and I still still love watching oh. trains go by. And uh, you know, I don't regret anything about leaving the railroad. I loved it all. I was privileged to be one of the first three calligraphers that when we had Lime Morse in the park for the first time in 1990, uh, we had just hooked up between this station and Lagan. And uh, then I joined the, I can't remember his name, the fellow that was on the Railway Days Committee. He passed away and so they talked me into uh, taking over. I was on the committee for six years and I was pretty much involved then. Then my wife passed away and I lost interest and I passed it on to other. But I've, I've been, I think, 23 years I've been here for railway days. I missed three or four, but that was it. Wow. How about you? I well, I volunteered for, uh, for the railway days for, I can't remember how many times. Quite a few. Four, or five, six times that, that I did it. I'm a latecomer as far as the Heritage Park is concerned. I, I just felt um, every time you come through the front gate, it's like you're stepping back in time. And uh, that was the way I felt. And, and, and when I was involved on the committee, uh, we spent many evenings here having meetings and walking around the park. And it was just like stepping back in, in history. How about you, Andy? What did you Well, it was kind of nice to sit at a desk like this and watch the trains go by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like going back in time when we were young <laughs> and working away at, at, uh, at, the, at the COVID and the train orders and whatnot. But I am involved with, uh, with Morse code uh, every night. There's a group of us that get together on, uh, on long distance telephone lines all the way from Montreal to, to, uh, to Vancouver Island. We get on every night for a, for a half an hour and send code to each other. So it's still alive in so far as that's concerned. You know, once, once you have railroaded, it's in your blood forever. Yeah, and, uh... that's true. You know, ask my wife every time we pass a railroad a train train tracks, I have to make remarks of looking for train tracks every time I travel anywhere. <laughs> every time there's a freight leaving Calgary going west, uh, 
coming up from Northwest. And I hear them blowing for the uh, crossing down in Bonus. And uh, it just, oh, it, it's just there. You'll never lose it.